at least the, the way I framed it in this presentation was to say that there are different communities within the development enterprise. And the way that aid officials and the way that the elite researchers think about aid effectiveness is somewhat different to the way that frontline practitioners think about um, effectiveness. So for a frontline practitioner, you're trying to be useful on a day-to-day -day basis and you're trying to make sure that you're a professional, faithful employee doing your job. But for by the time those, that range of different activity gets aggregated and it gets talked about in Busan in Korea, for example, then you know, the aid intelligentsia is stressing out about getting to all the wording is right on the, on the international agreements, and, you know, imagining that, and, well, hoping that in some sense um, the coherence and coordination powers of within development turn on the extent to which people are uh, responding to these kinds of documents. And so I was just trying to say that those, those are very different communities of practice and, uh, and they both have a place. There's, you know, it's a, we need to have uh, good research on these things. We, there's an important role for international actors who want to try and articulate uh, agreements between organizations and nations to make sure that resourcing and activity is done in a coordinated way. But you know, when a frontline practitioner is showing up for work every day, I, I don't think they have in the back of their head, uh, am I being faithful to what was agreed on in Busan? They're just trying to survive. They're trying to do, trying to do their job. So once you have, once you recognize that there's something of a disconnect often, and a necessary almost disconnect between what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis versus what gets talked about at a higher level of aggregation, then you just need to, that implies that there are very different ways of thinking about what this concept called being an effect, aid effectiveness or development effectiveness might actually mean. So, um, and then sort of between those two things, then you also have the, you know, a lot of the, the actors that are doing development are organizations or countries trying to enact a policy or enact a program. And uh, those particular uh, actors exist in a political economy within their own country. And uh, in a country like Cambodia at the moment, for example, um, what does it mean for the World Bank to be effective? Well, as it happens, for various different reasons, the, the whole lending program is in abeyance at the moment. We're not lending any money because of some disagreements with the government about um, how a uh, particular uh, program of work had been implemented, right? Now, if you have a very narrow, or at least have the intelligentsia view of development effectiveness, you'd want to sort of have a checklist of things that you're doing. You want to, are you contributing to Millennium Development Goals? Are you effectively coordinating with other actors? Um, it's kind of, if that's your metric of what constitutes being effective, but your whole lending program is suspended, it's kind of hard then to claim that you're being effective when there's no activity to be done. But there can actually be a way of being effective, and that <laughs> will mean uh, trying to re restart negotiations with the country, trying to ensure that an ongoing dialogue is sustained, and that you won't be able to measure that in any sort of formal accounting way that would then you know, be uh, able to be presented as part of a, a broader platform of work, but it's, that's what being effective means in that particular context. And so part of the broader uh, way in which we've been trying to think about this stuff is to say um, there is sort of the big picture international level agreements way of thinking about um, development effectiveness which uh, you know, reflected in Millennium Development Goals and these kind of things, and you're, you're effective if you are contributing to these international agreements. Um, and then there's the, the, the more micro, super micro level uh, activities of day-to-day -day employees, but there's sort of a, a missing middle. <laughs> um, and we call that sort of our middle way approach to development, which is sort of trying to think about how can organizations build up their own capacities to be useful. Um, and a lot of that, a capacity to be useful um, is about responding to the prevailing problems that exist in a country, but those prevailing problems may or may not be <laughs> the ones that, <clears throat> when you try and respond to them, add up to things that the rest of the world would ordinarily recognize as being effectiveness. So that's sort of.
even within the intelligentsia space, even when we have sort of researchers that, in, the, in the you know narrow sense of people that worry about trying to net out the impact of a of a thing called a project, um, we uh, find ourselves at the moment with, in a in a in a world where there's a particular dominance way of thinking about what counts as a plausible, defensible answer to the question of whether my project in country, in Ghana, for example, actually works, right? So uh, in the way in which we've set that debate up right now was a fairly narrow set of criteria for what counts as, a, as, a, as an effective answer to all of that. And part of what I was trying to say with that was that uh, even with a very neat and tight research design in a strict methodological sense, data doesn't exist in a theory-free zone. <laughs> uh, d data always has to be interpreted with, in, in, in the context of uh, ex with expectations and with, with respect to a theory of change that, that, um, that makes sense of that data. Um, so I was basically saying if you took uh, two projects, but then in this case they happen to be two seeds, and unbeknownst to you, one of them was an oak tree and one of them was a sunflower, and you put them in the ground, and you had a tight timeline for effectiveness <laughs> in the narrow sense um, being put on you, and you checked back in uh, in, uh, in a year's time to see how well those seeds were performing, you'd have a, a beautiful flowering sunflower six feet tall beaming away at you, and, and you'd have nothing on the, on the, on the other one. And if you were a strict empiricist, you'd be saying, wow, my, my sunflower has been spectacularly successful. Aren't I, aren't I a great horticulturalist? I've done very well. And, and, and isn't this other seed terrible? And isn't this other, it's a failure. We have nothing to show for it. But that, that, that interpretation would only be correct if you were willfully ignorant of a, a theory of seed production in which you would know that uh, it actually takes only about six weeks for a sunflower to reach maturity, and it takes two years for an oak tree to even begin to pop up through the ground, um, in which case you've made a very fundamental error of attribution regarding the effectiveness. So the point of that was to say, well, at least in horticulture, we have theories of change that, that correspond to each of the kind of in interventions or seeds that we have. Um, we don't have anything remotely like that in development, it seems to me. We assume implicitly that uh, all projects unfold in a nice little neat straight line and that the, the challenge is to measure the, the steepness of that gradient and you've, you're a failure if it's a flat line and you're a spectacular success if it's, if it's nice and vertical. But um, most of the interventions that I happen to worry about and work on um, unfold um, what we call a step function, sort of lots of nothingness than a big change. And if you look at what's going on in the Arab Spring at the moment, for example, it's, if you look at the governance indicators over the last 10 years, only heading downhill in terms of their measured effectiveness, but all of a sudden now we're seeing a, a flourishing of democracy. Um, or they're, if, they're not, if they're not step functions, they're J-curves. They get worse before they get better. <laughs> um, and if you're not aware of that, you can suddenly start to make proclamations about the impact of projects that if you are unaware that you just happen to be in the trough of the J-curve, not only have you not had an impact, you've actually made things worse. <laughs> um, so the point of this was to say, well, at least in, in this one field called horticulture, we, we, make dis, we make determinations about impact and effectiveness conditional on a, a theory of change or a theory that of of seed production that we we work with, whereas in development everything has to be unfolding on a straight line, and if you and we deploy a very particular kind of uh, instrument to assess the impact of these things, usually now uh, randomised controlled trials. But my point was simply that uh, uh, even the squeakiest, cleanest randomised controlled trial didn't give you an accurate interpretation unless you had a good theory to, un to inform that particular thing. And uh, the sun clouds and oak trees just seemed a nice sort of juxtaposition, but I think a lot of people are starting to recognise that's a more generic problem. As I said, most of the stuff that I work on, um, is on these days at least, is on uh, local level justice reform, trying to make sure that dispute resolution procedures and the gradual uh, transfer of rural systems that previously existed in the minds of village elders and chiefs into something that uh, is a bit more universal, that can be adjudicated 
through professionals um, called lawyers or whatever. Um, and that's a very different kind of intervention or a different kind of problem. So um, it, it's important to look at these things historically because the, the, you know, the law as we now understand it isn't the outworking of a great legal mind that sort of had a very clear goal and everything, all their activities were conditional on moving towards that great aspiration. It was, um, you know, it's how do we make an existing situation a little bit better now? And then once we get to that point, how do we make that little situation get a bit better? So it was working iteratively. And it's only clear looking back rather than looking forward, which, what came to be effective. So what might be effective? Well, you know, when, from the point of view of where we are now looking forward, there's a whole range of plausible options that one could choose. Um, most of the time in development, we, we, we don't want to work like that. We want to work like this. We want to say, well, there's my goal. That's what I really want to, that's what I think is the answer to the problem. So everything we do then is conditional on getting to that. Whereas this kind of problem that we're working on is much more open-ended with respect to where one could go. And it's only with, you know, with the virtue of 10 years looking back that you um, say, oh, that's, that's what came to be effective. That's what ended up being the answer. But we ended up here, it was with a different set of actors, a different set of circumstances, we could have ended up over there. And it's not that this one's better than that one, that just that's how the system evolved over time. It took us over here rather than over there. Um, so to do that effectively is a, is a different kind of research task. And what we've been trying to do with our work on local justice reform is um, put local evidence uh, compiled by local researchers into the decision-making space where the next steps regarding transformation are being undertaken. So we're not trying to set ourselves up as the <coughs> arbiters to sort of give a thumbs up or down verdict on whether what they're doing is working right now as such, though that might be, might be part of it. Certainly not, some, not in that sense of um, will this be publishable in an elite journal because we've satisfied all the methodological hoops that we need to satisfy to get ourselves published there. We're just saying uh, at the moment most of these debates about local justice reform are occurring in a data-free zone. It's, it's, it's anecdote versus anecdote, it's sort of one power play versus someone else's power play and uh, we are bold enough to think that it might be a little bit better if, if some evidence was inserted into that conversation to move that forward. Um, but because of the sensitive nature of these questions and because of the, you, when you're messing with or change, changing uh, the rule system in a society, those rules are very complicated, not just in a technical sense, they're complicated because they're very context idiosyncratic, they're by their nature very uh, much in, embedded in a constituent of the local culture even. So to have a bunch of white guy experts fly in and sort of deem what should be happening in those situations, even if it's technically the right way of thinking about that, is just going to bounce out of their decision making space because they, you know, in the same way that we would if a bunch of you know, foreigners came to our country, in my case Australia, and started dictating what should be happening. It was like, you know, you have no clue about my country. What, who, who are you to come and start uh, changing what's going on? So our approach has been to embed local researchers in, within, in my case, within the, within the World Bank's uh, country team. But you know, working as much as possible with local researchers and investing a lot in building up their capacities to do local research so that we produce good enough evidence to be able to move a policy debate constructively forward and constructively in the sense of uh, making it a little bit more evidence-based than it might have been otherwise. And then the decisions are what the decisions are. We're not sort of saying, we don't, our job isn't then to sort of cast judgment necessarily on whether this was a fantastic idea. It will only become apparent over years, decades even, how long or whether that, that kind of approach was, was working or not. So, um, so you know, we're not in the business of trying to say, well, we know what the answer is. I mean, if we have, we know what good land law is, we know what good administrative law is, because it works fantastically in Finland, so we'll hire a bunch of Finns who know all about how to set up telecommunications law, for example, to go and work out this particular problem. So we, our starting point is ignorance. <laughs> um, and, our, and our second point of moving from that point of ignorance is to say, let's pay our dues to this country. Let's uh, 
let's respect what's already there um, and let's try and uh, bring what we can by way of best social scientific research practice to bear on this particular issue as it now stands and pay up and just be patient enough to be able to be then part of this ongoing dialogue. And in, in a very specific case in a country like Cambodia, for example, where, they, where the big issue was trying to uh, nurture a labor law, for example, there was no labor law. And in some sense, in the initial, initially, that was very attractive to, <laughs> to foreign uh, producers because they figured they could kind of just do what they want. And, um, but over time, as their production expanded, they just by necessity recognized that actually you know, having decent labor capital relations was pretty important. Being able to respond to international critics who were claiming that they were just, you know, exploiting local labor was symbolically and substantively important. So they needed a labor law. Now, you know, we have numerous examples around the world of what an effective labor law looks like, um, but you can't just cut and paste that from one context into another. You have to try and the challenge in Cambodia was how do you nurture an indigenous labor law that makes sense to Cambodians, that has local legitimacy for not just Cambodians, but for international actors. When the Gap and Benetton, all the big companies are doing business there, they want a serious law that they can, that they can engage with. So the initial task, the initial response, and quite an innovative response in Cambodia was not to import an existing system or even just you know a prototype and then sort of adapt it. it was, um, Let's create a space wherein uh, the government, the international actors, and, lo and, and labor organizations can negotiate uh, over time and uh, something that will become labor law. <laughs> and initially it was non binding, and everybody was saying, That's, how can you, how can, it's, it's not even a law if it's non binding. How can you possibly even claim that it's a law? The idea was the same. In the in the you know, common law sort of sense, we'll just we'll let a set of practices emerge. We'll let a set of uh, transparent uh, <coughs> processes be put in motion, whereby uh, something like the beginnings of an agreement can be nurtured. And by the time you put 800 cases, as now that they're up to through that system, you actually now are moving from non-binding to binding. It has become it, it, beginnings of a law instead of then. And uh, even if 10 years in now, looking back, we said, well, if we'd hired five smart lawyers from Belgium, we could have probably nailed that in five months. Why did we have to take 10 years? So you've nurtured it. It has whole content and credibility by virtue of being through a domestic political process and come out the other end looking like something that Cambodians now own as their own. And, it's, and it has elements of similarity, of course, with how it appears elsewhere, but ultimately it's, it's, an, it's a, 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 a law that, can, that Cambodians can be proud of. And it's, it's not what you'd actually would have designed from scratch. It's, it has, it's evolved and gone this way rather than that way because of this particular space. So I like those kind of examples. So I think it's, it's, an, it's an instance of where the international community was useful. It, was, it wasn't just uh, completely less a fair left on you know, just left to emerge in its own time. It was, uh, it, was, it was a space that was created, and in that space, all sorts of weird and wonderful things happened. And I, I like seeing that. I think you can, that's what's replicatable out of all this. Not the form, right? Not the content of the law. It's the process that's the Petri dish within which that was allowed to grow. And that's when we talk about what's replicatable and what's transferable in development effectiveness, What's transferable is, 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 the, is the principles and the, and the, and the, the decision-making spaces wherein these things evolved. And that's when I see that happening. That's what I, that's what I think, yeah, we've actually been useful in development, <laughs> but we haven't been prescriptive. We haven't sort of uh, claimed almighty expertise on a particular issue. We've just said, well, let's, let's create a space and let a good contest happen, and we'll let whatever happens as a result of that good contest be what it is. One of the things that uh, the group of us that I work on this have been concerned about for a long time is that you can uh, see quite sustained advances and progress in, in various different dimensions of development, but the one that seems to lag behind a lot of the others is the capacity of governments to implement things and even implement relatively basic everyday services like uh, schooling and health and, and those kinds of things. Um, so in, when you look at the 
amount of energy and resourcing and development that is done, an awful lot of it goes up to up front to designing the perfect looking project down to the finest detail and making sure that it's everything looks like what a, what we think a, a, a well designed project should look like. And then we kind of assume implementation and then another bunch of people show up after the fact to assess it and make and make big claims about implement about the effectiveness of this thing. So it's a very bimodal kind of allocation of resourcing, and a lot up front and a, little, and a, and a bit more down the, at the tail end, but there's kind of this missing middle. Um, so both as a, an observed reality that you have you know, countries that have been independent for 200 years, in the case of Haiti, uh, taking an awfully long time to achieve even some pretty modest demonstrated capacities to do things on the one side, um, and yet from the from the donors sort of development active side, <clears throat> a, a vacuum almost with respect to worrying about these, uh, impl these implementation issues, which are kind of seen as a little bit boring, as a bit prosaic, or just not really where the serious intellectual work happens. All the all the brain power is in the you know getting the wording and the content of your design right, or running some nice randomized controlled trial at the end and peering you know as the white guys in wet lab coats at the end, sort of being the scientists that make the decorative statement about impact. Um, so we're trying to sort of make the implementation side cooler than it has been for the for its practice, but with it not just in its own sake, it's because we ultimately think that part of the broader package of modernity is, is making the, a, a, a state system capable of doing what state systems are supposed to do. And a lot of those are non-negotiable tasks pertaining to uh, to education, health, and uh, public finances, and, uh, and justice, and so when 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 countries persistently show sort of a flat line with respect to their capacities and you know, capabilities of to implement these things, uh, we that's what we call a capability trap. And our research agenda is about trying to unpack that a little bit more, explain it at one level, but ultimately trying to figure out how to be more. You had to be useful with respond to you know when we when we were invited to a particular country to respond to a particular problem. How exactly do you help? In the case of Lance's work on India, to, how do you help the Indian government to do, do a better job on getting kids to learn stuff in school? Um, yeah, so that's pretty much. I can't give an. Truly objective answer to that because of what I, what the, the, the gaps that I see are the gaps that I happen to think are the salient ones, and so I, I'm trying always and trying to encourage students to put their brains behind the, these kinds of issues because for me they're the ones that I personally find interesting. But from an applied point of view, I also just think they're interesting by way of moving uh, moving the agenda forward. So. Um, I guess to be consistent with what I've just told you, <laughs> I, think, I think this question around how we um, how we uh, enhance the capabilities of of, not, well, of governments in the first instance, but well, organisations more generally, how you figure out how to put the, the, not just in a design sense, how you sort of structure that. That's how we instinctively want to think about things. And we think it's the problem with the design. The organisational chart needs to be reconfigured, or we need to pay people more money, or. Those, those are relatively prosaic sort of standard ways in which we do it. We're trying to think about how you put different kinds of uh, pressure, I guess, or some kind of how you try and ensure that um, what that, what the organisations do rather than what they look like is is, uh, is is what we measure, is what we ultimately finance and reward. Those 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 are important issues. For another, as I indicated before, I think another really big question is how we address these problems in development for which there isn't a known answer up front. So the Cambodian labor law is an example of that. But there's a whole, once you start thinking about this stuff, they're, these are legion, they're everywhere. A whole bunch of problems for which um, we don't know and shouldn't pretend to know that we have the answer up front. And, but pretty much everything in the way the development business is structured heavily rewards the expert who has the answer, who can run around countries and give big lectures and say nice things about, you know, if only you invested more in microcredit or only you invested more in your urban property rights systems, then you too could be on the path to great riches. And that's only ever one part of it, but that's the, the more sort of serious analytical question really is, well, we just don't, we can't know what the answer is to a lot of these kind of questions and presuming that,
even with the 10 smartest people in the world, that we would figure out that answer. That in itself becomes part of the problem, that we want problems to be solved that way. And we reward people for doing that. And we think that because you've got a PhD that you've invested all this energy in getting it, that to be an expert in the true sense of the word, you're paid to provide answers, not try to complicate people's world. Um, but I think you know, a lot of these questions we're dealing with, complicating it is exactly what we should be doing because in the sense, not complicating in the sense of just uh, trying to obfuscate and, and, and make it more confusing, trying to clarify what is, what is inherently a, conf a confusing task and trying to short or fast track that learning process um, for any group of people is, um, is, really, is, really, um, is really, I think, an important issue. The other, the other big gap to the methodologically, I think, is that we are, uh, as researchers, we kind of have a good set of tools for dealing with small numbers of cases, you know, ethnographic case study kind of work, one to 20. We have all sorts of nice econometric tools for dealing with 200 to 20 million. <laughs> um, but the, you know, so not, this is another example of a bimodal distribution of our, of our brain space, as, as I said before, with um, project implementation. A lot up front, a lot at the end, not much in the middle. Uh, same sort of thing with, with research. It seems to me that we have goods. We know how to deal with small ends. We know how to deal with big ends. But the problems of the world often come in sort of bunches of 40 or 50 or 60. And as researchers, we're very clumsy, it seems to me, but for no obvious reason, really. Well, maybe it's obvious. But sort of we just, we, as a research community, we seem very lame when it comes to addressing problems for which there are instances of 40, say. Uh, it's too big for uh, ethnographic case study work, it's too small for anything high powered statistically. Why can't we say something more sensible when, when the end of our problem is, is 40? Um, and as it happens, you know, a lot of things in development, you know, something's probably been tried in about 40 different countries or so. So how do we as researchers, you know, make much, be more fruitful with, with these middle range kinds of problems? So whether it's implementation, whether it's kind, the kinds of problems we address or the kinds of tools that we bring to bear on them. I think you know, there's, there's always, you know, <laughs> what, you know, we've only gone so, so small. I, mean, if I feel that sometimes we're just like you know, medieval doctors. We're still putting leeches on these things. And we, got, we, don't, we don't have a good theory. We don't have a, we, we, we're so, we, and we so load up on um, one particular set of skills that we think is what we need to do that. When, these problems require all, all sorts of different skills and they just need to be put into a mix and they need to <laughs> come out the other side. But ultimately, you know, this is how we're, we're in social science and I'm, I, I emphasize often the social as much as the science, but uh, hopefully as more generations of people work on this stuff, we'll, we'll get a little bit better. But for me, the end game has never been about trying to, you know, reach a technical nirvana where we actually know what to do with, about this. I think that's a scary world. We don't want to be in a world. That's why we novelists write books like Frankenstein and stuff. You know, once, once people actually think that they've nailed all of this stuff around humans, then super scary stuff starts to happen. So I'm, I'm much more comfortable than a lot of my economist colleagues are with with a bit of uh, with deep uncertainty. I think that's 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 I don't know, that's how it should be. <laughs> so you know, there's, there's no shortage of ways in which we could improve the rigor of the quality of our work. There's no shortage of interesting problems we should be addressing on. Um, uh, but if we get a little bit beyond the, the leeches as our theory of how to cure illness, then that, that's going to be progress. But I, I don't want us to be in a world of you know the perfect. A squeaky clean machine that we've actually nailed this stuff because that's a way scary world and I don't want to I don't want to live in that world.